hope you're all thawing out from last night. It's a very cold night. I actually had to use a blanket last night. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. And today we complete our study of that first section of the Sermon on the Mount. We finish the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, if we have discovered, are a description of the inner life of genuine believers. The inner life of every true follower of Christ and the inner life to which we as believers aspire to as well. The inner life of a follower of Christ. For those of you who may not know Christ yet, who may not have repented and had faith in Christ, it is a description of the kind of life to which you repent. When you turn away from something, it's not about cleaning up your life and then getting saved. It's about committing to Christ this kind of life. A life that is truly Christ-like. Well, in this passage, I noted last week, there is sort of a gentle turn. It's a a subtle turn. It's not real concrete. But there's a a sort of gentle turn uh, in the Beatitudes from Beatitudes that are more about the inner life to how that inner life, that inner character, will flesh itself out in your actions. And so we talked about the first four Beatitudes, about being poor in spirit, about being meek, about hunger and thirsting after righteousness, about mourning over your own sin. And then we look to purity or single-mindedness, a hunger and thirst of righteousness, a peacemaking, suffering well. So this is character that is active and alive in the way in which you live your lives. So what we're talking about here is the blessed life of a genuine Believer, how do we look like Christ? How do we operate like Christ? How do we live like Christ in the external sense? And the kind of joy that we can find as we pursue Christ's likeness, this genuine joy that Jesus describes here, the, the blessed life. It's for all those believers who continue to per- persevere in these things. So let me read to you these Beatitudes. I'll begin at the beginning, beginning in verse 2. I'll read all of them down to verse 12, and then we'll focus our attention on those last three, it starts in verse 8 and goes to the end. Just follow along, beginning in verse 2. And he opened up his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and Utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of God. Something that Jesus is going to make more clear as we study his words, his teachings, his sermons something that he makes abundantly clear in Matthew is about the nature of the kingdom, that the nature of the kingdom has a sense in which it is already being fulfilled and that it is not yet fulfilled. Theologians have a term for this. It's called the already not yet idea of the kingdom of God. There is a sense in which his kingdom is already at hand and there is a sense in which these things are not yet fulfilled. And we've noted these things as we've looked at each one of these beatitude we've noted that each one of them uh, the blessing is what we enjoy in this life now there's a there's a sense in which we can live and have a blessed life even amidst suffering even amidst the difficulty we can find these blessings but the ultimate fulfillment of these blessings is when we finally see God face to face well none of these to me demonstrate the already not yet idea of the beatitudes of the kingdom more than the next beatitude. If you've been following along, we have made it to the sixth beatitude. The sixth beatitude is there in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they shall see God. So number six, if you're writing down notes, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. Now, this is called the beatific vision or the beatitude ific vision. It's the vision within the Beatitudes. What is the vision? They shall see God. Now, the most obvious idea of this, I think as we just look at this, the seeing God idea, the most obvious thought about this is, is about our future, right? The not yet sense of this Beatitude. We have not yet seen God. We, we can't see God with our physical eyes, or we die. The holiness of God is so bright, it's so, it's so luminescent, the Shekinah glory of God is so amazing, so brilliant, so beautiful, that we cannot look upon God with our unholy lives and survive. It's why Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, knew, he cried out, woe is me, I am dead, I'm undone, I'm to be destroyed, because he knew as a sinner he could not look upon the holy God. Even the train of God's veil he could not look upon without death. And so when we think about looking at God and seeing God, we think about that not yet sense. Did you hear the verse that Pastor Ryan read earlier, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2? Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. John's saying, we're one thing now. We are saved. Our spirits have been redeemed. Our spirits have been changed. They've been bought, bought by the blood. We've been reconciled with God because of Christ. We are redeemed of heart. But physically, we are not yet what he is going to make us. We are redeemed of spirit, but not redeemed of body. A body is tainted. It's tainted with impurity. It's the residue of that old man, right? We have a new nature. We have a new spirit. But our bodies still bear the markings of that old man, that old, those old thought processes, and we face it every single day. We battle our flesh. It's still that old man, the residue of that old man that is still there that our new creation souls are battling against. I was reading this week in Exodus And the people gather around the mountain, and Moses is to go up and meet with God up on the mountain. And the people, the Shekinah glory of God, the the power and righteousness of God is so true, so real, so real, that the people of God are not even permitted to touch the bottom of the mountain. I don't know how they discern what the bottom of the mountain was, but that's what was instructed. They're to gather around this mountain together before Moses goes up, and you shall not even touch the mountain. And of course, we know that Moses himself, as he went up there, which probably and presumably was the most righteous man among the Israelites, Moses goes up there, and he cannot even look upon God. No, he hides in the cleft of a rock. God covers him there, and Moses is affected just by the, the tail parts, the, 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 the remaining parts as God passed by. We cannot look upon the glory of God and survive. We cannot see God. Even Moses could not see God. But we have this hope that one day, God will resurrect us. He will reconstitute our bodies. He will give us resurrected bodies, bodies fit for eternity, perfect bodies, whole bodies, bodies that you don't have to every January. Think about what diet am I going to go on this year? Bodies that are perfect and whole and ideal and are not tainted and marked with sin. No, these are bodies that can behold the presence of God. In fact, we get this idea that we will be like Jesus, we will see him, we will have a resurrected body just as Jesus did, there will be no stain of sin, no stain of death, and we will see him face to face. We get this idea all the way back in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 19, that in glory, that eternal heaven, there is no need for light. There is no need for the sun or the moon. God's glory will shine and light all of eternity the idea is repeated in revelation chapter 22 it says there that they will see his face and his face will radiate with the very glory of a shining shining there in eternity you know you get this idea i i I think wrongly a lot of christians think about eternity and they think 
you know, you're going to get to heaven and you're going to think, you know, I, I really need to go see Jesus. I mean, after all, he saved me. And where's the line to see Jesus, right? Is there some kind of Disneyland type queue that I'm supposed to get in and go back and forth? And Jesus is sort of sitting there at his throne and saying hi to everybody or like the pastor in the back of the church or something. I mean, is that how it is? No. We get that description out of Isaiah and out of Revelation. The idea is that God's face, God's visage is illuminating everything in all of heaven for all eternity. You can't go a place where Christ is, where you can't see him. You will see him everywhere. And I don't know how metaphysically that all works out, but you're going to see Christ face to face the moment you set foot in heaven. And you will see it for eternity. You will be in the presence of God. You will see Christ's face for eternity. The picture of this lighting, illumination of God's glory will be there and you'll be in, the, in His presence forever, forever. What a wonderful idea, isn't it? A pure in heart, those who have been made right with God, those who stand justified before God, those who seek after the purity we stand forever with God. We enjoy His presence, seeing Him forever. Now, John's point in uh, 1 John 3, John's point, and I believe to a lesser degree, Jesus' point in Matthew is this. Since one day we will may be made pure in body, since one day we will, in our purity, be given new bodies and see the purity of God and its unveiled sense and all this glory and Shekinah beauty, since that is true. Our prime objective now in life is to live pure lives. If, if purity defines our eternity, if purity defines the, the, the way we can see God, if purity defines Him, then we ought to live pure lives now. We ought to be like Him. And so John says this. You heard this a moment ago. Everyone who thus hopes in Him, hopes in seeing Him and being like Him, everyone who thus hopes in Him does what? He purifies himself. See, one motivation for the pure life, John says, is that one day we will be like him. So the focus in that sense is the not yet sense of the beatific vision of seeing God. Live a life of purity because purity, utter purity, is what the very definition of you and eternity and God will be forever and ever. Now this is John's point, but if you caught it, I said that this is to a lesser degree Jesus' point. Why would I say to a lesser degree this is Jesus' point? Because I believe Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount is not focused on the not yet sense of seeing God. The not yet sense of purity and resurrected bodies. Rather, I think Jesus is focused on the already. On something that we can understand and sense even now i mean i'm sure jesus understood and and his words would be perfectly coherent and probably in the back of his brain i mean he must have been brilliant he must have understood the not yet sense of it and the sense of people getting resurrected bodies and jesus understood all these things but as jesus describes this i believe he's talking to people about living in the kingdom right then as followers, as disciples, and we discussed this about how this is a message to his disciples. He, he went up the mountain and he gathered his disciples around. This is a message not just to the crowds, this is to his followers. What is life in the kingdom like? What's it supposed to be like? What's the kind of life you're supposed to lead? And so I think Jesus' primary focus was not on the future, the not yet, as wonderful and glorious and beautiful as that is. I think his primary focus was being pure in heart now so that we can see God even now. Now, obviously, this doesn't mean that we can see God with our physical eyes. I know there's all sorts of spurious visions out there, people who claim they've you know, had a conversation with God. I remember a guy describing how he was uh, shaving and God showed up and began speaking with him. And, of course, the, the pastor that I was listening to preach about this guy, he said, and my question was, and you kept on shaving now you look at these visions of God in the Bible and people are falling on their face. They believe they're dead. They know they're judged. They see the glory of God and they, they know they're to be judged immediately and some do actually die in touching or seeing uh, things that are divine like this. No, I don't think he's talking about some kind of weird, weird, bizarre, physical, actual vision. Just as the phrase pure in heart does not mean cardiovascular sanitary condition. He's talking about a spiritual reality, right? A pure in heart is a spiritual truth. Seeing God then, I think, now, we can experience Him now spiritually. 
we could see him in a spiritual way. Paul would later say in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, that now we see. He says we can see him, but we see dimly, he says. Now we see dimly, then, he says, we will see him face to face. Now in part, then in fullness. So I take Paul's words to mean the very same thing. We can now see God, although in fullness later on, but now there is a spiritual sense in which we can experience God. And any one of you who is a genuine believer would say, I have experienced God. I've mentioned to you my own personal testimony I won't tell you the whole thing again, but one of the elements of me getting saved was that night that I repented. I had a very concrete moment of salvation, and that night after I repented and turned my life over to Christ, I laid in bed and smiled from ear to ear, and I could not wipe that smile off my face because the joy was just flowing in my heart and overfilling my whole whole inner being, and it just came out in emotions What was I doing? I was experiencing God. I was seeing God. God had made me pure. My desire was to please Him, to honor Him, to repent and turn my life over to Him, to follow Him as my Lord. And guess what? I got to see God. Jesus is saying the pure in heart are blessed in experiencing God's presence, even now. Well, what does it mean to be pure of heart. I read several commentaries. They all seem to agree that there's two basic ideas here, and they're both very closely related. Let me tell you these two ideas, and it will help us understand what Jesus means here. To be pure in heart is, first of all, to live a life with purity at the center. It's a life lived with purity at the center. The, the word heart there in the New Testament is never used to talk about uh, the actual pumping blood moving organ in your body. It's talking about the seat of your eternal, ultimate identity. It is who you are. The inner self, the eternal personhood, the, the fundamental core, your, your, your very identity eternally. So, so it's the, the source of all your volition, your personality, your individualness. That's your heart. So to be pure of heart means that at the very core, you are focused on holiness and purity. It's a freedom of deceit. Your morality, your ethics, it's not motivated by spurious or selfish reasons. No, you just simply want to do what is right to honor and glorify God. You are pure at the very core of your being. That's what it means to be pure of heart. It means to embrace God, to worship Him at the very center of who you are. Now, I know we're not born that way. God has to grant us that purity. He has to regenerate our hearts and give us that nature of purity. We need a new heart, and I get that. But this is a good test of salvation, whether or not you're truly born again. Is asked that question, at the core of my being, at the, the very definition of who I am, do I simply crave and desire to please God in righteousness? Do I want to be pure? This is similar to what Jesus said earlier about those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. At the very core of my being, do I detest sin? Do I love holiness? Do I seek to worship God in everything I do? Am I pure of heart? Does purity describe the center of who you are? This is why I'm always skeptical when someone tells me they're a Christian and yet you look at their life and it seems they're always toying with some sin or getting as close to sin as they can without actually committing sin, and at least in their minds, committing sin. There seems to be a movement now among Christians and even many pastors who led them down this idea that because of God's grace, because of our freedom in Christ, because we're not on the law anymore, that we can just sort of be free to pursue all these things that are as close to sin without sinning as possible. They don't seem to be driven by a love of holiness. 
a love of purity. They seem to be very afraid of being legalistic, and so they never want to think in terms of righteousness and right and wrong and ethics and morals and, and pursuing holiness. That's not their language. No, their language is all about the freedom to do whatever they want. Well, at the core of the heart of a genuine Christian is a purity, a desire to be righteous, a desire to obey. obey. It's exactly what David prayed in the Psalms. I delight in your law, O God. Meditate on your precepts. Think about these things all the time. I love these things. This is my life. It's the center of who I am. I love your commands. That's what it is to be pure of heart. Other people, maybe they're not trying to sin, but maybe they're just distracted by other desires. They desire a promotion. They desire money. They desire stuff. They've got a hobby. They've got all these distractions. And purity of heart is sort of down the list somewhere. Maybe they want to be pure. Maybe they want to be righteous. But it's just not the cry of their heart. This is a genuine believer, one who is pure of heart. This phrase, pure of heart, can also mean something very close to this, and that is a life lived with a single-minded focus. So this idea could mean like a pure vision, a, a single-minded drive. Of course, it would be to worship God, to glorify God single-mindedly. Everything is geared around this focus to glorify God. And you find ways, you, you think of ways to glorify God, even the most mundane things. I remember someone asked me, are we supposed to glorify God when we're choosing what socks to wear? If you don't know what socks are, it's like this fabric you put over your foot. People wear them when they wear shoes. You heard of those? Someone asked me, do I glorify God in picking out my socks? Well, Paul says, whatever you do, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. So he thinks of something really mundane, eating and drinking. I think we can think of ways to glorify God in whatever we do. The small choices, the big choices, all the things that we do, we live with a single-minded focus, a purity of vision, a purity of heart to glorify God no matter what. Of course, this is closely tied to the idea of purity, right? Doing everything motivated to do what is right, to do what is pure, this focus goal. Well, if you live like that, just like people who train their lives and focus their lives on other aspirations such as running marathons or winning things or doing whatever, if you live like, like that, there is a great reward, and it's far greater than winning a marathon or accomplishing some great feat. The reward is that you get to see God. You focus your life on Him. You focus your activity on Him. Your heart is pure and focused. Your reward is that you experience God. Okay, verse 9 gives us our next beatitude. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Number seven, blessed are the peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. The word peacemaker here, it's uh, sort of a generic word. It's just a combination of two words, uh, peace, the word peace, and the word to make or to do. These are people who do peace. These are the people who make peace. This is a person very simple who seeks and causes peace in whatever context he is in. It applies to making peace in terms of his own personal relationships, his own personal interactions, but also helping others find peace, right? It's coming to situations that are stressful or perhaps a little bit tense, and he's the kind of person that has a level of peace, and he can bring this peace to bear on the situation. He's a peacemaker. I wrote down some questions, just like I did last time. I wrote down some questions for myself to ask myself whether or not I'm a peacemaker. Let me give you these questions. I wrote this down. Do you work to avoid arguing with others? Or do you always seem to find yourself in an argument? There are some people, maybe they don't even like to argue. Maybe they don't like to bicker. Maybe they would say, I never don't like to fight. I don't like to argue. And yet they seem to move from one argument to the next, to the next, to the next. They always seem to be caught up in an argument. Why? Because they're not peacemakers. 
They're not looking for peace. That's not important to them. The idea of peace and good, solid, peaceful relationships is down the list in terms of their motivation. On top of their list is winning arguments, making points, proving something about themselves. And so they find themselves moving from argument to argument. It actually says this in terms of of pastors, requirement for, for pastors, that they cannot be quarrelsome. I hate to admit that among my group, pastors, among my group, I'm not talking about our pastors of the church, but among pastors in general, there are some who just move from argument to argument. They just seem to always be in some sort of argument. Maybe it's with people in his church. Maybe it was with folks that attend. Maybe it's with other pastors or other denominations or whatever. There always seems to be an argument. There always seems to be a chip on his shoulder. He's not a peacemaker. I also wrote down, do you end gossip and negative talk? Or do you listen and welcome gossip and a negative talk? Every once in a while, someone will say something like this to me. Well, Pastor, I can't help it. People just come to me, and they, they have these problems with other people, and they just find me an ear that will listen, someone who will listen to them. Let me tell you something. If you start saying, Brother, this is not the right thing to talk bad about somebody, let's work through this, and let's talk to this person and find out if we can resolve Let me tell you something. Gossipers will stop coming to you. They won't want to hear that. What they're looking for is not an ear to comfort them. They're looking for an ally. And if you're the kind of person that is always an ally of the gossipers, guess what? You're just as bad as a gossiper. You're not a peacemaker. I have to ask myself this question. Am I the kind of person who likes to hear, who, who is, is welcomes negative talk about people, gossip about others? If so, I'm not a peacemaker. Do you seek forgiveness the moment you know you've done something wrong, or do you defend yourself at every turn? Some people just live their lives defending themselves. They're always afraid of what everybody thinks, and they certainly would never apologize. I've had people tell me this. I told the early crowd. I, I've had people tell me this in counseling sessions, and they think it's some sort of great character trait that they bear, and they say something like this, and this is a character trait not from the Bible but from the world, and it goes something like this, I apologize for nothing. No, well, that's not the kind of character trait we want. We want, want to be the kind of people who are quick to make an apology, who are quick to seek forgiveness, who, who are ready. Now, I would say not a politician's apology, right? A politician's apology is, I'm sorry if you feel offended. No, that is, that's not an apology. An apology genuinely owns up to your sin. Now, you may disagree on the fine details of your sin with someone, but you can at least admit. I found that saying sorry and apologizing diffuses just about every situation. When people are at odds with one another and, and, and they're, they're griping and complaining and fighting and debating with one another and someone says, you know what, I have wronged you and I, I need to apologize. It seems to cause a peace in the situation. It really it brings up the question, when there are these situations, are you the kind of person, are you the grown-up of the crowd who owns up, who accepts the blame? You say, I'm not the one to blame. He's the one to blame. Do you know how childish you sound now? Own up to your blame. Ask forgiveness. Say you're sorry. Apologize. That's what godly people do. That's what peacemakers do. They're well aware. We started this, this is at the beginning of the Beatitudes. Poor in spirit, meek, mourn over their own sin. They're well aware of their own sin. And they're ready to make an apology. Last question I wrote down is, do you help solve problems or do you just talk about problems? I hate to say this, but there's a kind of people, Christians even, People in the kingdom, in churches, in Christianity, and there's always drama around them. There's always some kind of crisis, and there's other people with crisis, and there they are in the middle of it, and it seems like no matter what's going on in their life, they're in the middle of some big drama. You sort of wonder, are they peacemakers, or are they seeking out this drama? They enjoy being sort of in the middle of it as 
maybe seen as a counselor, seen as some sort of advice giver, but they seem to find themselves in the middle of drama all the time. They're not peacemakers. Paul calls them busybodies. They find their importance, they find value in being an authoritative voice in the middle of crisis, but actually doing nothing to solve the problem. Do you help solve problems? Or do you just talk about problems? The solvers are the ones who are the peacemakers. When people are stirred up and angry when there's gossip floating, are you the kind that shuts those things down and settles scores and talks to people and establishes some kind of peace, some level of, of joy? Or are you the kind of person who just gets wrangled in all these things and caught up? Are you the kind of person who entertains gossip? Are you the kind of person who argues? Are you the kind of person who causes reconciliation? Well, that's a key idea, isn't it, reconciliation? It's a key idea of being a peacemaker. Did you know that this is the most Christ-like thing you can do? Is to help people reconcile with one another? It says in Colossians 1 that Jesus makes peace by his blood, reconciling us to the Father. And Jesus is called the mediator between God and man. Why? Because he, he reconciles man to God. He helps there to be repentance and forgiveness. He helps there to be reconciliation. He brings people into a right relationship with God and with one another. He causes peace. And so when you are a calm peacemaking person who helps people find forgiveness, who helps people find repentance, who helps people reconcile, who reconciles yourself with others, who resolves issues, who makes peace. When you do that, you're more like Jesus than you ever are any other way. Jesus, the Son of God. So the blessing of being a peacemaker, the blessing of this beatitude is is what? They shall be called sons of God. You become truly Christ-like when you're a peacemaker. And Jesus Christ encountered all kinds of aggravation and ire. In fact, Jesus in his day would have seen a lot of anger from the Jews to the Romans, from the Jews among one another. Of course, Jews, of course, attacking himself. And it says Jesus was reviled, but he reviled them not. Peter says he spake not a word. Jesus would confront the Pharisees. Jesus would demonstrate the Pharisees' life of hypocrisy, but you don't hear Jesus going around with the disciples, criticizing, complaining, condemning the Pharisees, gossiping about the Pharisees. Did you see Pharisee Nicodemus today? Did you see what he was wearing? You don't hear Jesus talking like this. Jesus is a peacemaker. He was a man of peace. And when you're a peacemaker, you're like Jesus and you're called a child of God. What a blessing. Well, this final beatitude, at first I thought, well, I'm going to hold off on this. It's about persecution. We can do several sermons on persecution. Surely I can wring three or four sermons out of this. But I realized, you know, Jesus talks a lot about persecution in the book of Matthew. We're going to get back to this. Uh, hold on to your seats. We're going to look at this later on. But, but uh, that's going to provide me time to just go over what Jesus says right here, right now. We don't have to delve into all the things about persecution today. We can just talk about it as though Jesus was talking about it on that day. And he just mentioned it. And you're going to find out that Jesus, as he mentions persecution here, he doesn't get, all, get into all the kinds of persecution. He really just mentions one kind of persecution. Now look what it says there at verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He turns the attention to his disciples who were listening, and he was applying it to their hearts. So this isn't a different beatitude. It's the same beatitude. Verse 11, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you for, and utter all ki kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who are before you. So number eight, blessed are the persecuted. Blessed are the persecuted. Now let me say three things. As I look at this passage, what Jesus says here, I think Jesus says, gives us three things about how persecution is a blessing. Let me repeat these things and then we'll wrap things up. First of all, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. In short, 
That means being persecuted for the right reasons. Can a person have a martyr's complex? You bet it. People kind of feel like, oh, woe is me. Everybody's against me. Life's so hard. But sometimes they bring that on them themselves. Christians sometimes, even in in an effort to evangelize, can be sort of a jerk about it and bring on a level of persecution that is not for the right reason. I can give you examples from my own life. I've witnessed to people, I've given people the gospel in anger and frustration out of being cocky, out of saying something like, well, hey, I'm going to heaven, you're not. That's not a right reason. That is not the right reason. So being persecuted for righteousness' sake, it's being persecuted for the right reasons because you've acted righteously. That's what that means. Then it says, when they revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. So secondly, I would say this. This is persecution here that is not merely physical punishment. Persecution is not always a physical punishment. Clearly, Jesus has in mind here simply slander and gossip and mockery. Now, he's going to get later on. You don't have to worry. He's going to get later on to martyrdom and death and torture. But right here, he's just talking about words, gossip about you. So I'd say this, don't feel like that you should not expect any persecution because we, you know, we live in a free country. My religion is free. It shouldn't be persecuted. Trust me, if you live righteously, if you do the right things, if you live out of pure, a pure heart, you will be persecuted. Can I say this happens even, sadly, inside churches, sometimes among Christians. You do what's right and you're talked about falsely you're accused people talk about your motives you'll be persecuted for just simply doing what's right another thing i would say is don't feel inferior i mean sometimes christians we get this especially in america we get a little inferiority complex right you know well we're not dying you know we're not getting tortured so we can't really say anything no the first time jesus introduced the idea of persecution to disciples is about people talking negatively so this must be a hardship it must be difficult and if you've been persecuted in this way it is actually difficult for doing the right thing being mocked for it being maligned for it, gossiped about for it, verbally abused. And the question is, that's when the rubber hits the road. Do you find this joy? Do you continue or you try to revile back? Finally, in the end, one more thing that Jesus says about being persecuted. We find out what the blessed nature of being persecution is. By being persecuted, in persecution, we join a host of faithful people who are likewise persecuted. Look at the last verse of the Beatitudes, verse 12. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In fact, that word rejoice is the same, has the same root as the word blessed. You're blessed in that day when people persecute you, when they mock you. But you're blessed because you find yourself joining a group of people who have been mocked and persecuted throughout the centuries. You join a group of people who have been faithful to Christ, ultimately epitomized in Christ himself, who was indeed the first martyr, killed for the truth of the gospel. The truth is, persecution only lasts for a little while, and In the scope of eternity, persecution is just a a blip. It's just a small moment. It's just a few years, perhaps even even at worst, a a lifetime of suffering. But you join a group of people in glory forever. As you behold the face of God, you join this group of people who were persecuted again for the right reasons. You realize that people can slander you and hurt you and mock you and assign wrong motives to you. And you know that this is just temporary. You know that one day your reward is to be with Christ forever with all those who have likewise been persecuted. You being persecuted just puts you in good company so you can find yourself blessed.
So we pursue the Beatitudes. We try to be like Christ. We try to reform our inner lives with the, by the power of the Spirit, according to the Word. We do this. We follow these Beatitudes. We study these things. We learn them. We do this to the point where we're maligned about it. We're persecuted for it. And when that persecution comes, we still nevertheless rejoice. Let's pray God would give us the attitudes described here. Father, we thank you so much for what you've given us. We thank you for the joy that you provide for us in following Christ. Help us do this. Help us see this as our privilege and joy to be pure in heart, to be peacemakers, even to be persecuted for doing these things. Help us live these lives that represent you. Lord, we're going to discover these great blessings. And not only that, we're going to discover as we look into the passage that Jesus begins to preach to them after this, we realize that we become salt and light in this world. We're different. And we bring a joy and a seasoned truth to this world. Lord, I pray that we would be salt and light by living the Christ-like life in pursuit of of the Beatitudes. Help us in this. Help those who don't know you to repent and follow Christ and become this by his power, by the power of the word. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.